Starting off this countdown, we have absolving sins with money. Basically, back in the day, the Catholic Church told people that they could absolve their sins and get a ticket to heaven if they just paid them. Like you were paying the church for forgiveness. Sorry, that's not how these things work. It also got to the point where people were paying for future sins. Not only that, they claimed that for a fee, relatives could get their deceased loved ones out of purgatory. And people fell for this all. Not only that, but poor people thought that they were screwed. They're like, if we sin, it's over. We can't afford to pay to get our sins forgiven. I wouldn't be surprised if the rich went around committing crimes and killing people than being like, here's some cash, I'm all good now, thanks. In our ninth spot, we have imprisoning Galileo. In 1663, Galileo was like, science is greater than God. He also said that the sun was the center of the universe and claimed that the earth moved around it. I mean, he was on to something there, but just, you know, he was slightly off. Anyways, the church didn't like these claims because it conflicted with the teachings of the church. So they imprisoned him. He was imprisoned in his home for years. I mean, they threatened him with torture, imprisonment, and even being burned at the stake. So let's just say he got off easy compared to those other punishments. It wasn't until 350 years later did the church be like, okay, yes, we agree, Galileo was on to something. Moving on to number eight, we have cutting funding. For years, the church gave thousands of dollars to a nonprofit organization, Companeros, that would help Hispanic immigrants get access to healthcare, among other things. That was until they found out that Companeros supported a gay and lesbian rights group. So the church cut the funding to this company for their connection to the LGBTQ2S plus community. They're not the only group that the church has done this to though. No, apparently, and I quote, since 2010, nine groups from across the country have lost financing from the campaign because of conflicts with Catholic principles. Moving on to number seven, we have the gay clergy member. In 2018, a secret Catholic group came forward claiming they had information all about their clergy member, Monsignor Jeffrey Burrell. They claimed that he was using the gay male dating app Grindr and would visit gay bars weekly. Now, let me just say, there's nothing wrong with being gay. What's wrong is shaming this poor man and outing him. And the poor man had to resign. Obviously, this is something the Catholic Church doesn't want us to know. Why? Because they say homosexual acts is immoral and contrary to the natural law. They also say homosexual tendencies are objectively disordered. And they also preach celibacy. So having a clergy member that is gay is highly controversial for them. And they try to hide it. A lot of Catholics were outraged when word got out. Scariest part is how they found out about Jeffrey in the first place. Apparently the group was tracking his movements based on the apps he was using. Pretty terrifying and also very, very wrong. Moving on to number six, we have Joan of Arc. Turns out that the church wasn't the biggest fan of Joan of Arc. In fact, at one point she was pretty much the Catholic church's number one public enemy. Long story short, she believed that God was speaking to her and had told her to start an uprising to get the English out of France. By doing so, she pissed off some high powered Catholics who wanted her gone. So they decided to put her up for trial. But legit, they had no evidence against her. But they were like, whatever, fake it till you make it, right? So they just accused her of heresy with no evidence because it was a lie. And on top of that, they denied her counsel, which was against the church's rules. They just hated her and wanted to get rid of her. I think there were like 70 plus charges brought up against her. One of them being for wearing men's clothing in which she was burned at the stake for. In 1431, in front of a crowd of thousands of people, they lit her on fire for wearing male clothing. But it was discovered after her death that she never even did this. Literally, they killed an innocent woman. Why? Because they were probably intimidated by her. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the slaying of women. Pope Innocent VII wasn't innocent at all. In fact, he was terrified of witches. He said that they were real and a huge threat. So he created a huge witch hunt. He dispatched his men to Germany to try witches. And due to the pressure he put on them, countless innocent women were killed after being accused of being witches. All because Pope Innocent was paranoid as hell. Not only that, but in 1487, a book was written all about these witches. It said that this book promoted burning them at the stake 
and that influenced a number of killings. Plus, the book was just filled with lies, like saying these women would stop cows from producing milk and would ride on broomsticks in the air. It's just truly messed up and spread misinformation and paranoia. In our fourth spot, we have the burning of the dead. Apparently, the church holds grudges because 43 years after John Wycliffe passed away, they had his body dug up and burned. Now, let me explain how it got to this point. So, John saw fault in the Roman Catholic Church and saw how it was corrupt. So, he believed that people should worship God and Jesus according to the Bible, not according to the popes and their bishops and priests, because people are corrupt. But the Bible is not. He also believed that people should interpret the Bible for themselves and not how other people tell them to interpret it. Well, the church did not like this at all. So when he passed away, they ordered all his books to be burned. They also ordered for his body to be unburied. And for some reason, it took them years to get this all done. So 43 years later, his body was finally unburied and then torched and then his ashes were just thrown into the river. In our third spot, we have the misuse of power. Just this year, it was discovered that the French clergy had taken advantage of over 200,000 young individuals since the 1950s. It is absolutely disgusting. The height of this happened between the 1950s to the 1970s. That's when most of the cases were discovered. Then there was a resurgence of cases in the early 1990s. And obviously, the Catholic Church doesn't want anyone to know about this. In fact, it's obvious that the church was turning a blind eye to the perpetrators. They were more focused on protecting themselves and their reputation. They did not care for the victims at all. A report said, and I quote, the Catholic Church's immediate reaction was to protect itself as an institution and it has shown complete, even cruel indifference to those having suffered abuse. Like I said, it's absolutely disgusting. Moving on to number two, we have the number of priests. In January of 2002, it was discovered that 234 priests have had allegations of sexual misconduct made against them in the last 50 years. You heard me, 234. That just makes me sick to my stomach. These individuals are using their title and control to take advantage of others. Some of the victims did file lawsuits against a number of dioceses and got multiple million dollar settlements in some cases. But that still does not take away their trauma and their PTSD. Even though the Catholic Church held a worldwide summit to talk about all this, it wasn't that effective as priests were still caught taking advantage of individuals years later. Starting off this countdown, we have the nuns. In 2019, Pope Francis for the first time addressed the horrors that happened to nuns in the Catholic Church. Priests and bishops and other church officials have been taking advantage of nuns for ages. This was an ongoing problem for years and the church wasn't doing anything about it. They were too busy focusing on covering up even bigger scandals and issues. Over the years, more and more nuns have come forward saying that they were victims. Some were afraid to speak up because they were dependent on the church and literally couldn't leave. Although Pope Francis acknowledged what happened, it's unclear the steps they are taking to prevent it in the future. In our ninth spot today, we have the Knights Templar. So Philip IV of France, as well as the Catholic Church, are directly responsible for torturing and executing innocent individuals back in the 14th century. Basically, Philip did not like the Templars in Spain and wanted to get rid of them. So he sent out his men to round them up, arrest them, and then imprison them. He then accused the innocent men of terrible crimes like sodomy, heresy, and renouncing Christ. Any of those crimes were punishable by the death penalty. Again, they were innocent, he just wanted to get rid of the Templar order. He then would torture the Templars so that they would confess. He would use a rack to stretch out their shoulders until they dislocated. Or he would have their private parts smashed. This was all done while the church knew that the men were innocent. In our eighth spot, we have Pope Pius XII. In this case, it's what the church didn't do. According to a recent discovery of archives, Pope Pius XII was fully aware of what the Nazis were doing during the Holocaust and chose to remain silent. He knew of the mass executions of the Jewish individuals and he dismissed this all. In fact, he said that they were unable to confirm the crimes, so that's why he didn't speak up against them. It says a lot when they refused to publicly condemn the Nazis. In fact, apparently his silence was so that the Germans didn't come for them, so that the church could 
should always be successful. They were just caring about themselves and not about the thousands of innocent individuals being killed. Moving on to number 7, we have the violent murders. Back in 1095, Pope Urban II gave rise to the Crusades during his reign as the head of the Catholic Church. He called all Christians in Europe to go to war against the Muslims. And it was not pretty. It literally said that they killed so many Muslims that the street ran with blood. And this was only the beginning. Waves of crusades continued until 1396, and although Catholics were not the only religion involved in mass violence, Pope Urban got it all started. And it was a violent time to say the least. Everyone was killed, no matter their age. Some people's heads were even put on sticks and then they would carry them around to scare others. Like that is hella messed up. In our sixth spot today we have William Tyndale. During the 16th century, William took it upon himself to translate the Bible into vernacular English so that more people were able to read it. But for some reason, the Catholic Church did not like him doing this. Which is weird, wouldn't they want the Bible translated so more people would become followers of it? Anyways, William actually had to go into hiding because the church was coming for him. They even burned copies of the Bible that were being smuggled around Europe. In the end, William was captured, tried for heresy, and then burned at the stake. He literally did nothing wrong. Wanna know something even more messed up? Years later, the church was like, ah yes, let's translate the Bibles. They then turned to William's translations and used a whole lot of it. And then they never even apologized. It, ridiculous. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Pope Alexander VI. So, uh, Pope Alexander VI was uh, said to be one of the worst popes in history. Why? Well, he is known for something known as the Banquet of Chestnuts. He basically invited 50 women over and told them to strip for him. Then he threw chestnuts on the floor and forced the women to get on their hands and knees and just surround their feet like animals. To make matters worse, he told the men that he invited that he would give the man who could get it on with the most women jewelry or fine clothes. So then they were all fighting over these women. This guy was hella corrupt and sick. Not only that, but he liked to watch horses get it on. That is disgusting. In our fourth spot today, we have the cover-ups. So a lot of shady stuff has gone down with the Catholic Church. There's no denying that. For years, the church knew all about the scandals surrounding the leaders of the church and how they would take advantage of innocent individuals, but they kept brushing this issue under the rug. Then in 2001, the Vatican told them that any cases should be reported directly to the Vatican hierarchy. Years later, they still weren't dealing with any of these cases. In 2004, instead of getting rid of the priests in question, they just moved them to different churches or different countries. So that didn't really stop them. They just had a new set of people that they could take advantage of. They literally cared more about their priests than the victims. Moving on to number three, we have the grooming. Over the years, people of power at the church have groomed a number of young individuals. Today, I'm sharing the story of Michael. When he was young, he was groomed and forced into doing things he didn't want to do. One of the brothers of the church would bring him to Broadway shows and movies. This was all part of the grooming process. Then when he entered the congregation of Christian brothers, that's when he was abused and groomed by four or five different men. This is absolutely disgusting. And of course, the church would do any and everything to make sure Michael's story or others didn't get out. In our second spot, we have the funding. CBC News and the Globe and Mail recently obtained files that exposed the Catholic Church for spending some of the $79 million that it agreed to pay residential school survivors. That's right, they spent money that was meant to go to survivors of their residential schools. But instead, they took most of that money and put it into things like their Bible study group or for their personal lawyers and unapproved loans. Whereas other churches, including the Anglican, United, and Presbyterian Church, paid the full amount of compensation owed to the survivors without an issue. But the Catholic Church took the money and used it for themselves, which is disgusting since they played the biggest role in residential schools and the horrors that took place there. And in our number one spot today, we have the unmarked grades. 
Earlier this year, thousands of unmarked graves have been found by residential schools across Canada. Residential schools were funded by the federal government and run by the churches. They would tear families apart, taking the children and forcing them into these schools in order to assimilate them, and they were stripped of their native language and culture and traditions. While in the schools, they were treated terribly. They were neglected, tortured, and even murdered. In these unmarked graves, thousands of innocent young individuals were found. This went on for 120 years. Tens of thousands of indigenous children were sent to these schools. Thousands never returned home. Currently, the grounds are being searched for unmarked graves at the Mohawk Institute, and soon more and more residential school grounds will be explored. And sadly, we all know more bones are going to be unearthed. It's a very sad and tragic reality. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have St. Michael's Church in Dublin. This may be a church surrounded by the artsy urban setting of Dublin, but if you go deep, deep inside the church, you will find mummies. Yep. Mummies. Its limestone vaults keep the air dry, which makes it the perfect holding area for preserving them. The church was built in 1095. Yep, old. And it is said to have likely been a temple burial site before it became a church. To paint a picture of the crypts of the church, they of course have stone walls, are extremely dusty, and they're filled with coffins. And probably the devil is hiding behind them. Cute story time. When my brother was young, he saw a poster of The Mummy, the movie, and he said to my dad, Dad, what about the daddies? And that's what I think about every time someone brings up mummies. Ah, my brain. Coming up in our number ninth spot today, we have the Duomo of Cosenza, Italy. We were bound to have one church from Italy in here, as, well, Italy is seemingly only churches. I did a bus tour throughout the country, so I would know. This is a church in an ancient part of Italy, and it is so old, that nobody knows when it was built. You would think that archaeologists would be on that and figure it out by this point, but as such, they haven't figured it out quite yet. Probably because it is haunted. Dun 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 by Satan himself. The church became a cathedral around 1184, and its architecture is supposed to be a sight to see. The church also has many burials on site and is home to the bones of its first priest. Humans are fascinating. Do you ever think about why we keep the bones of something that once was in a box and then put under the earth so that we can visit the place where it was buried every year even though we can't see it? It's just a solution for our mind to be at peace with the concept of death. We're just fascinating. Okay, moving on to our next terrifying church. In the number eight spot, we have the Church of the Assumption of Our Lady, Guadajara, Mexico. But don't be fooled. It may look old and terrifying from the outside, but it is just as old and terrifying from the inside. However, it does have one really cool aesthetic that all the other churches are jealous of. On the perfect time of day, when the sun hits it on its right angle, the church's bricks seem to glow with a fiery orange just representing the depths of hell itself. I'm just joking. Inside its walls, it has neo-gothic vaults with impressive artwork from the modern and late medieval period. But it also has a beautiful collection of mummies on display. Among the bodies is a child who was killed for converting to Catholicism in the 1700s. There have been many people over the years that have claimed to see her eyes blink and her hair move. Not terrifying at all. Coming up in our seventh spot today, we have the St. Thomas Anglican Parish of Mulgua, New South Wales, Australia. Yeah, this church reminds me of your classic horror movie church. Small, old, and just downright creepy. This church has a very dark history and continues to creep its locals and visitors alike. There is a legend that has two boys who died in a fire in the bell tower after a prank went horribly wrong. Since then, it is said that any kind of light angers the spirit of these boys. There have been many reports of lights going on and off, even including the lights of cars going on and off as drivers pass by the site. I wish I lived close to this place so I could try this out, because this sounds like a ghost hunter's gold mine. Coming up in our sixth spot today, we have St. Andrews on the Red in Selkirk, Canada. This is the oldest church in Western Canada and was created in 1831, which compared to the St. Mikan's church created in 1095, it's not that old. But nevertheless, the devil may still house this creepy landmark. It is said that both the church and its graveyard are filled with restless spirits that had died from tuberculosis and many varieties of the influenza. It's also the resting place of 
have a lot of the earlier settlers and HBC officers. Visit at your own risk. In our fifth spot today, we have St. Michael's Chapel in Hallstatt, Austria. A beautiful church surrounded by a truly spectacular view of the mountains and an alpine lake. But inside, you will find the largest collection of painted human skulls. I'm sorry, come again, Melissa? The largest collection, which means there are other collections out there. What on earth made someone look at a skull and think, yes, yes, I think I should paint this. Just why? Someone out there is thinking, because art. This is also a chapel that was made during a time when Catholics believed that they had to be buried in a consecrated ground so that they could rise from their graves when the end of the earth came. Were they predicting a future apocalypse, AKA Walking Dead style? Hopefully, not hopefully. <laughs> but since this was such a popular need, the graveyard actually became quite crowded. And so as a result, Naturally, they decided that the solution of storing bones for religious displays was a viable solution. As for the person who decided that painting those bones would be fun and aesthetically pleasing to see, we have no name. Satan sounds like a good name to me. In our fourth spot today, we have St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Key West, Florida. This beautiful white church may look sparkly and alluring from the outside, but you should know better by now. It's only so new because it's been rebuilt so many times, because it is cursed. The site was once a seminal burial ground, and then the land was privately owned by the Fleming family before the church was built. It became a church as a result of the Fleming widow being assured that her husband's remains that were buried on the land would not be disturbed. But of course, that promise was broken, and as a result, the ghost of John Williams Charles Fleming still haunts the site. I would have thought that it would be her that would haunt the site since it was her promise that was broken, but Maybe that's just me. Coming up in our third spot today, we have the Norwich Cathedral in England. Built in the year 1096, this church has a very gothic but yet Romanesque look. The area around this church is almost a thousand years old, and as you can imagine, there have probably been a lot of ups and downs within these years. As a result of such a turbulent history, it is believed that there are many spirits wandering the surroundings. Some believe it to be previous bishops and priests, and possibly nuns. And some believe it to be people who were burned at the stake. Personally, I I think it's the latter. If I were burned at the stake, you better believe I'm coming back to haunt you. Gosh, I'm so glad to be living in 2022. In our second spot today, we have the Roslyn Chapel in Scotland. Known for having the finest architecture in Scotland, the church was founded in the 15th century. There are many ghostly legends surrounding this church, including the White Lady, who was believed to have been cursed by an evil spirit and is waiting for her knight to save her. People have said to have seen a barking dog spirit and the ghost of many monks walking around. Around. People that have worked on the building, especially in the crypt, have vowed to never work there ever again. So that's saying a lot. I mean, if I were going to pick a place that I would think the devil would be wandering in, huh? This would be it. Finally, in our first spot today, we have a personal favorite of mine, the Church of Our Lady Before Tin in Prague, Czech Republic, or more commonly known as the Devil's Church. Yep, if that doesn't tell you everything, then I'm not sure what to tell you. I have actually personally visited this church and the underground of this church, and I have to say, it is truly anxiety provoking. <laughs> this church is a beautiful landmark in the center of Old Town Prague. Created in the 14th century, its look is quite the reflection of the times. Intimidating. Inside its walls are altar paintings and old Baroque designs. But of course, it is also the home to many tombs and burials and dark secrets. Some say many brutal killings and hangings have happened in and around this church makes you ask the age-old question, what is the point of worshiping the Bible if you ain't gonna practice its teachings? <laughs> Humans are a mystery to me. Mm -hmm.